and this is, for me right now, this is one of the most serious things I can say. I thank God for my parents. And I didn't always thank God for my parents, but I, but I got to a point in my life one day when I realized that they were the right parents for me. And I wanted to be the right child for them. And God began to touch my life. And the, the second thing I want to thank God for is my wife, Sophia. That's my new nickname for her. It means wisdom in Greek. The word wisdom in the Bible is Sophia in Greek. And wisdom is always as a woman in the book of Proverbs. And she's continually encouraging people to read the book of Proverbs and get some wisdom. Amen? But I thank God for you, Gio, because you've been there and you've, uh, you took care of me while I was recuperating so much. You guys don't know what she went through. When I came home from the hospital, Seven months ago, I could hardly walk in the house, go up the stairs, down the stairs, no, all these things. And it's taken seven months for me to get to this place here. Seven months ago, this weekend, I had life-changing surgery. My number had come up. You ever hear that expression? When your number's up? That's it. My number had come up. I had a congenital heart problem. And that was the day that my heart gave out. Had an aneurysm that was blowing up. My aorta, the main uh, artery in the, in, the, in the heart, was dissecting itself. Shredding itself into pieces. My blood wasn't circulating. For at least six or seven hours I was awake talking telling people how I felt what was going on but I don't remember a thing because the circulation was so bad and uh, so God really did a miracle putting together and having the right surgeon I guess I moved again at the right time to rebuild my heart he literally rebuilt my heart, gave me a new aorta valve, a, uh, a synthetic one, and then he took the pieces of my heart and made three new valves coming out of the aorta because they were all destroyed. So rather than, you know, put in new parts, he took what I had and he rebuilt it. I'm like a rebuilt engine. <laughs> and a rebuilt engine is always better. So I thank God for that. And I thank God for what he did and how he uh, how he orchestrated everything to give me a new lease on life. What did I say, Melissa, when I said that? Did I say a new lease on life? I came out of, when I woke up out of surgery and there were a few people had been coming to see me and I said to uh, Melissa, God's given me a new lease on life and he's given it to everyone. And, and Gio keeps feeling like if everyone could learn from what happened to me and how God was working, it would give them a new lease on life too. And I pray that this morning some of the things I talk about will be a blessing to you and help you. And I promise I'll try not to go long. I keep telling the preachers here on Sundays, keep it down, don't go too long. And uh, I'm going to try to live by my own words. So I want to read a scripture to you. It's in... The book of Psalms, chapter 31, and it's verse 15, the first part. And it simply says this, My times are in your hand. My times are in your hand. My life is in your hands, Lord. And the timing of the circumstances and the situations and the things that I go through in life, they're in your hands. They're not in mine. As much as I'd like to have control over everything, Thing, I don't have control over everything. Just my wife would like to have control over everything, even worse than me. She cannot have control over everything. Our life is in God's hands. Now, do we get into control? Yes, we do, because we actually fight God for control. We want it our way. All you have to do to believe that is to watch a, a little baby, a year old, two years old. They want it their way. They think Burger King is the answer. You can have it your way. 
McDonald's, that's the answer. You deserve a break today. Every baby wants it their way. And when they don't get it, what do they do? They cry like a baby. <laughs> Scream and shout. Carry on. Throw fits. You see them on the floors in supermarkets. Laying on the floor. <laughs> and then you wonder, what's wrong with those parents? Well, if you could look back a little bit, you'd find out that your kids probably threw a little hissy fits here and there too. And people probably looked at you and said, what's wrong with those parents? People have been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. But God has our life in his hands if we allow him. We have to give him permission to be the Lord of our life. My dad used to have a button when, I, when we were young, probably around late teens. And it was a big button. And it said, I am the king. And he reminded us of that all the time. He was the king of the house. This was his castle. He got the food. He paid the bills. He could do everything that he needed to do. He brought us into this world and he could take us out. He was the king. Until one day around Christmas time in 1979 when he and my mother asked Jesus to be the king of our household. They'd been watching Billy Graham all summer long and all into the fall. Every week they watched Billy Graham on TV and finally they knelt down and said Jesus will you be the king of our family and my father gave up the kingship and he never put the button on again he kept it on the on his dresser as a reminder he's not the king Jesus is the king in our life we become distracted when we're going through different things, when we're, as we're growing up, we want things, we need things, we think, or all these things in our life, and we begin to get distracted by all the things around us in this world. Jesus addressed this situation when he spoke to his disciples at the Sermon on the Mount, when he said to them, in Matthew 6 it's recorded, verse 31, 32, and 33, he said, stop being anxious about everything what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, where you're going to sleep. He said, stop being anxious. Which of you can add anything to your life by worrying about it? He said, but your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. Look at the birds. Look at, look at life. God takes care of His creatures. And if you trust Him, He'll take care of you. And then He said the most important words that He said probably in His whole life. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek his kingdom first. Meaning seek his will first. What is God's will? Worldly people, he said the Gentiles... The worldly people seek after these things. They are actively seeking after more food, more drink, more clothing, better houses, faster cars, shinier objects, more diamonds, more, th more things. They're always looking for things. And Christians, especially in the last 50 years, have gotten so caught up that Christians are, are not being as spiritual as they could be, and they're being carnal because they're wanting and seeking the same things. And he warns us about that. Now before I go any further, I have to make a, a, a short announcement. This month is Pride Month. Christian Pride Month. Now the world's not celebrating it, but I am. And my symbol is the bow that God set in the clouds in the days of Noah. He said, I have set my rainbow in the clouds to show you that I will always have a covenant with you and I will always provide for you and care for you no matter what goes on in the world. So I'm declaring 
that every Christian should be proud to be a Christian this month, and every Christian should stand up and refuse to give in to the wokeness that's going on in the world around us. You see, I refuse to call a boy a girl. You see, I know, I know it's not polite, you know, and you'll offend them, but you know what? We're in America, aren't we? Isn't this the land of the free? Because of the brave? Amen? So it, it's a, they can't tell me what they want me to be like or do, and I can't tell them what I want them to be like or do either. Everyone's free to do whatever they want to do. So if, they wanna, if a boy wants to call himself a girl, that's his problem. I don't, I don't, I have nothing to do about it. But don't tell me I've got to call you a girl because you're a boy. You've got an X and a Y chromosome and you're a boy. If my biology is correct there. <laughs> you know, we have a Supreme Court justice that they said to her, can you define a woman? She's, well, I can't do that. Why not, stupid? Why can't you say a, wo a woman is a female with, a, with two, what, two X's or two Y's? Two Y's. She's got two Y chromosomes. That's what makes a woman. That's what makes a female. What did God make them in the beginning? Male and female. I refuse to say that God made mistakes. God does not make mistakes. I heard somebody say it recently on a YouTube video. I think God made a mistake and he put me in the wrong body. <laughs> I got news for you. Somebody made a mistake and dropped you on your head. <laughs> You're in the body you belong in. You're just not comfortable with it. And you know what? Half the world is not comfortable with their bodies. Girls with curly hair want to have straight hair. Girls with pale skin want to have dark skin. Boys who have no beard, they want to have a beard and a mustache. Nobody's satisfied with the way things are. So, but I'm declaring, this month, I'm proud to be a Christian. Amen. You know, we sang, uh, I'm proud to be an American on Memorial Day. Well, I'm proud to be a Christian. And I won't tell you how to live your life, but don't you dare tell me how to live mine. Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to obey God. See, if the, even if the government says, you have to call this that, sorry, I'll obey God. Amen. You can decide if I'm right or wrong. That's what the apostles said when they said, stop preaching in this name of Jesus. They said, no, sorry, we can't do that. You may not like it, but we're going to preach in his name. We're going to tell the truth. We're going to stand up for what's right. And you can do what you want to us. You can punish us. You can ostracize us. You can, you know, kick us out. Do what you want. Like, I can't be in your club. Oh, oh boo-hoo. But the, the truth is, you can't be in my club unless you repent. So we need to learn to speak the truth in love, not in anger. I don't believe in anger and protesting in anger against people and doing stuff like that in anger. In love, yes, speak the truth in love. So could you all just praise God for Christian Pride Month this month of June? <laughs> Amen. And for any of our friends in Thunder Canyon, I hope that you are having some good Christian Pride Month too. Amen. I know John would like that for sure. Mercedes, I know you'd like it too if you're watching. So let me get back to this now. Enough for that. I want to share with you what I've come to realize. Uh, and that is that for a long time, I've had a major problem. I wanted to do things my way. For a long time, I've had a major problem. I was leaning on my own understanding. I was doing things the way I thought they should be done. I was following traditions and things that were protocols and doing a lot of things. And over the years, I've made a lot of mistakes. You see, when you, when you get to the point where you realize, uh, without God doing that miracle, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. When you really realize that you might not be here tomorrow, it'll change the way you think about today. If you let it. You have to let it. So what I've found out is that even when I thought I was seeking the kingdom of God first, most of the time I wasn't. And one thing stands out in my mind many years ago, probably 1977, 1976, in that time frame. I was living alone. I had met some people. I was considering quitting my job and going 
business with somebody else. And so I decided to fast and pray. Wait on God. So I fasted and prayed and I waited on God and God didn't speak to me. So I just did what I wanted to do anyway. I figured, hey, he's not telling me not to do it. I guess I could do it. But I didn't really realize that without him saying yes, what he was saying was no. But he was letting me decide. And I made a, I made a decision that started to put into uh, play a lot of things for the next several years of my life. Now, not that everything was bad and wrong. Not that it was horrible and I, and I ended up in a pit. But I wasn't in his perfect will. And it, it began, and that, that was a very early on start of doing things my way. I take after Frank or Blue Eyes. I want to do it my way. You see, my father had the big button, I am the king. But I had a small button that said, really, I'm the king. <laughs> Amen. Now back a while ago, not very long ago, but just a little while ago, Giovanna had uh, been going through something and she prayed, she asked God, I need to hear from you. And the Lord spoke to her and gave her a scripture, Psalms 119, verse 29. And I'd like you to make note of it. I know they're going to put it up on the screen. But if you've got a notepad, which I really would hope that a lot of you would bring notepads to church because there are good things to write down. This is what it says. Keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. You see, as I'm trying to say to you, we're all in the habit of deceiving ourselves. Now you may say, well, not me, I really listen to God. Well, I I know you. I know every one of you. I know you pretty well. And I know you don't always listen to God. I'm not saying that you're rebellious and that you don't love God and don't want to serve God and don't want to do the right things, but I know you are the king in your life. There's this battle always going on inside of us. Who is going to be Lord? And every day, Paul the Apostle gives us an example and he says these words that are eternal. I die daily what is he saying he's saying king paul has to die and let jesus be the lord every day because i'm in the habit of doing it my way i'm in the habit since i'm a baby of wanting what i want when i want it how i want it and if you don't give it to me i'll throw a fit some people throw fits by throwing themselves on the ground and crying other ones throw fits by giving you the silent treatment Others throw fits by making you feel guilty because you're worse than them. Husbands and wives have perfected this. They've perfected this whole thing of how to make the other one know you're not doing it my way. And I think you really should. So we need to realize we have that same problem with Jesus who is our Lord. And he wants us to stop deceiving ourselves so that we can have the privilege of hearing his instructions. What does the Bible mean? Basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. Basic instructions before leaving earth. And you can memorize it. And you know, you've got a lot of religious people that have memorized it. And they're walking around following not the Lord's will, but their traditions that they've been following from somebody else for a long, long time. And we talk about them. Well, we're not like those. We're not like those people. Because we're, we're listening to the Holy Spirit. No, you're listening to your own soul. Most of the time, we listen to our own soul. Now, I'm going to try not to get too deeply involved into certain things and I want to try not to go down rabbit holes today but I have been involved and I have done things in many different areas as a Christian I've started churches I've started ministries I've been a part of international ministries I know many of the well-known preachers and, and ministers around the country I know some internationally 
I might not look, I mean, we're in a little church here, but I know a lot of people because I've done a lot of things. And what I found out after I almost died, seriously almost died, and, and was totally incapacitated in intensive care for 10 days, and then at home for two, three months before I could do anything, basically, I've realized that I was doing what I wanted to do. As I began to look back, how did I make that decision to do this, to go here, to meet these people, to form this group, to be a part of that group? How did I make those decisions? I was on a roll, following the momentum of my life that I'd started myself. And it brought me to many places and it kept me going. But when the momentum stopped, I had to recognize I was in the wrong place in many areas. Not that I'm totally wrong. I will never admit to being totally wrong. <laughs> but, but I did a lot of good things that were not God things. I was involved with ministers around the globe working with ministers and people in Africa, in India, in Pakistan, South America, in Brazil, in different states around the country, in Texas and other places, preaching and meeting people and holding meetings and, and doing all sorts of things. And they were all good ideas. But God has shown me they weren't all His ideas. And if I'd have took the time and stopped lying to myself, I would have heard his instructions. I would have had the privilege of hearing his instructions. Because without listening to him, without stop lying to yourself, without stop, stopping deceiving yourself, you don't deserve to hear his instructions. He gives us different things about this. As you can imagine, I'm not very proud about all these things. And I'm... And I'm I've, I've missed God's will too often now that I've realized this. But along with my new heart, rebuilt, I have a new lease on life. And I have a new vision. And now I've got Sophia, that I recognize Sophia. You may think that's funny. The truth is, I've never appreciated her for who she is for many, many years. I've only begun to start to appreciate my wife in the past five to ten years. Before that, it was all about me. I'm the big guy. I'm the leader. I'm the spiritual one. I'm the guy doing all these things. But I've begun to realize over the years, as I've examined. You see, Keith told us that we're supposed to examine ourselves before we have communion. <laughs> I did some examining. I really did. So, I didn't deserve the privilege of knowing His will. You see... We don't think the way the Lord thinks. He tells us in Isaiah 55, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Do you mean to tell me that God can't be found all the time? Absolutely. He says, Seek me while you can find me. Because the hour will be here, or the situation will come when you cannot find me. Because your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. In other words, God is saying, listen, Emmanuel, there's a big gap between the way you think and the way I think. Big gap. Miguel, as high as the heavens are from the fish in the sea, God thinks differently than what we're used to. And what we're used to is thinking the way we were taught to think by other Christians who did not learn to think the way God was thinking. They learned from other Christians how, the, how to think. So we, as born-again Christians, have our own stinky traditions. You can talk about this denomination and that denomination and make fun of them and say, well, they do this and do that, and they stand up and sit down, and they come in at nine they leave at ten or nine thirty and then you know you can say all you want to say but the truth is we're no different 
We all do the same things. So he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, that's how my thoughts are for you. So you need, you need to seek me while you can find me. Since we don't act the way that God acts, and since we don't think the way he thinks, before we act, we really need to stop and ask him, what do you think about this? You see, what I've learned, and I put into practice quite a bit now, is when there's some things to do around our house that I say to Sophia, what would you like to get done? Because we don't think the same. I think this should be done and that should be done and this and that, and I don't worry about that. And she thinks this and this and that, and I'm not worrying about that. And what I've found is that if I just do things the way I've been doing things for 43 years, I'm going to keep getting the results that I've been getting for 43 years, which are strife, tension, anxiety, hurt feelings, not mine, <laughs> hers. And so I've come to realize, so I'll start to say to her, like if we have a day where we have to get ready for something, I'll say, what are you, what's important to you today? And I'm not trying to brown her up. I'm, not try, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as honest as I can because I don't know what's important to her because I don't think the way she thinks. And the truth is, biblically, the house is her domain, not mine. Biblically, the wife needs to run the household. Tech, practically, in the last couple of years, she's got us to get our second mortgage paid off, our first mortgage almost completely paid off, a car paid off or whatever, uh, other things paid off. Why? Because she's doing it the way that it should be done. Me, we'd still have the debt and I'd probably add more. So I've learned how to let go of certain things so that we can have peace in our home. And so it, this is really seriously, it's, it's a symptom of my life. I always think about my things first. I don't know about you, it, some of you may have realized this time goes by, but I, I want things done my way. <laughs> if I want to ring them bells, I'm going to ring them bells, Yamadi. <laughs> She's not ringing them with me. She says, this is America. Well, I won't back down. <laughs> These are private jokes in the worship team. So God wants us to do something. He wants us to think differently. He wants us to understand differently. We have to start to understand that most ministers are not truly spiritual people. In fact, a lot of ministers are just people that couldn't make it in the world, so they tried to make it in the church. And they gather a following in the church because they got stupid people around them. And they're blind people. They're blind leading the blind. And they're all going to fall in the ditch. So we need to start to think differently. We need to start to act differently. And the only way we can do that is we really need to slow down and start to really seek God. So he says this, David says this about seeking God. In Psalm 63, verse 1, he says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul is thirsting for you. And my body longs for you in this dry and weary land where there is no water. Are you seeking God like a dying person seeks a drink of water? If you're not, you're not doing it his way. You're doing it your way. Lord, I, Lord I'd like you, Lord, I need, Lord, I'm really in a hurry. I got to get to work. I forgot to do this. I got to go. So can you please tell me what your will is? Thank you, Jesus. I know you'll do it. And off we go. And, and he says... You just dissed me. Do they say that anymore? No. They don't say that no more? Oh, whatever. Whatever. What? Oh, ghosted. I've been ghosted too, yeah. I got, I got ghosted on Facebook. I post too many Christian things and I got ghosted. I got 5,000 followers on Facebook and I, I did a test to see how many people are getting my posts. And I asked them about 43. Getting my post. Because I'm being ghosted. So yeah, I've been ghosted and just, I know that too. But he says, earnestly will I seek you. 
my soul is thirsting for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Are we really earnestly seeking God's will? We're flippant about it. We don't take it that seriously. Now, some things don't demand us to be, you know, dry and thirsty land and seeking like we're dry, dying of thirst for water and getting his will. You know, it's like, you know, should I have a Hershey bar or a Milky Way? God, what do I do? You know, that, that's not when you ask God, because God will tell you the truth. He'll say, neither one. Okay? So anyway, before we complicate things, with our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own desires, our own will, just like the Gentiles, just like carnal Christians, just like worldly people, seeking after all these things, we need to stop and slow down. Here's what the Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs. Chapter 8, verse 17. I love them that love me. How many of you believe that God loves us all the same? In the general way, he does. He loves us all the same. He puts up with all of us. And my kids, I got to put up with them. You've said it as a parent. He's felt the same thing. You're just feeling what he feels. But he does say this. He says, I love them that love me. And they that seek me early or first in situations will find me. They that seek me early will find me. But we lie to ourselves. We love our children, just to go back for a second. We love our children equally in a certain manner, yes. But we love them differently individually. We love this about this boy. We love this about our daughter. We love this. We love, And, and that does something to our heart and touches us and bring, brings a special bond. When I was a kid in elementary school, I lived close to the, to the school. I used to run home for lunch a lot of times, and my mom and I would have lunch together. We spent days during the weeks and the months talking every day, having lunch. I'd run home, eat my lunch, and I'd run back and play in the playground. That created a bond that never changed throughout our whole life. Now, my sister Linda, I know, had certain things that she bonded with my mother, areas, stuff that I could never get even close to, but we're loved differently. And we need to stop this baloney. God loves us all the same. Yeah, that's because you don't really feel his love. You think, you, you think what you've got is the real thing. What you've got is, is it's like, you know, basic Christianity. God loves everyone. He gave his son to save the world. But that's personal. That's passionate. When he gave his son to you, he did it for a certain reason because he loves you individually. He thinks of every single one of us individually. I don't want to get caught on this. I'm getting stuck. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I love these verses here. I know the plans I have for you. You see, God knows what he's planning. And that word means, it really means this. I know the tapestry that I'm weaving for your life. You see the backside of the tapestry. You see it from your view. All you see is different colors and strings and knots and things like that. I see the other side. I see the big picture. I know what I'm doing. I know the plans I have for you. I'm weaving these things together. Yes, there's some pain over here. And yes, there's some sorrow over here. Yes, there's some joy here. But I'm putting it all together because I have plans for your good, for your benefit, for your welfare. They're not evil. God doesn't make mistakes and God doesn't do evil. And he says, he says, and so when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek for me with your whole heart. Go to your room and don't come back until you're sorry. How many times did you ever hear that? I heard it a lot. So I try to come out. I'm really sorry. No, you're not. Get back in there. <laughs> How do you know? I know. I can tell. Come out a little while later. I'm really sorry. You're not sorry enough yet. You see, I, I'm seeking for something from my mom. She's not going to give it to me because she knows I'm lying to myself and I'm lying to her. Why should she allow me to do the things that she has planned if I'm going to lie? 
And this is what we do to God. We lie to God. Oh, Lord, I'm ready. No, you're not. Oh, Lord, I'm really sorry. But no, you're really not that sorry. You're sorry you got caught. I'm really sorry. Yeah, because you got caught. Shoot. That's where most of my sorrow was as a kid, getting caught. I was really sorry I got caught, and I try real hard the next time not to get caught and do it my way. <laughs> so many of you have heard many stories about my life, of how I wrangled this and did that. But he says, when you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. That's, that's the parameter. It's got to be the whole heart. So, and this means something new to me because now I've got a new heart. And if I use the whole thing and seek God, I'll find Him. And that was for you. How can we truly seek Him? I love this verse from Proverbs chapter 8, verse 34. Blessed is the man who listens to me, who daily sits at my gate, waiting by my front door. You see, you've got to be waiting by the front door, by God's front door. You've got to be sitting at the gate, waiting for Him, so that you're ready to listen to Him. Okay? Proverbs 8, 34. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my front door. I love that. Jesus tells us in John 16, verse 13, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, and He will show you things to come. You really want to know His will? You need to get close to the Holy Spirit. You need to have the comforter come, and you need to make Him a part of your life, and you need to make Him a part of your daily life. You need to really be talking to Him, and you really need to listen to Him. And He will speak to you. He will tell you things, and you won't like everything He says, but He will tell you things. Satan is the prince of darkness. He's the master deceiver. And so he sends his agents into our lives to deceive us and to get us to believe a lie. And then we make the lie our own and we never hear his will because we believe a lie. Why is the world going through this wokeness? Why is there gender bender stuff going on? Because they're believing a lie. Because Satan is the prince of darkness. And he's out to kill, steal, and destroy. Before my father died, he had an encounter with God. Many of you know my dad was a pastor for many years. He was a, a policeman when I was a young boy. Then he quit the force. And he started a company. Became successful in business. And different things happened. But at 50 years old, he really got the call of God and he ended up behind a pulpit, pastoring a church. So he was serving God and doing many things for many years. But towards the end of his life, and this happened just a few months before he died, he was watching TV and he was watching a news anchor talking about all these different things going on and getting mad at him, yelling at him, calling him names. Stupid idiot. I don't believe how they're doing this. What's wrong with this SOB? Blah, 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 this and that. And he's sitting there doing this stuff. And he said, a, st a still, small voice came to him and said to him, you weren't always like this. Angry. He said, in fact, a little while ago, not too long ago, when you heard that man speak, you would have stopped and prayed for him. But now you're yelling. You're angry. And my dad went to bed that night and didn't sleep the whole night. He spent the night in self-examination. And he cried. My dad didn't cry. Believe me. He hardly ever cried in his life. Certainly not for me. <laughs> but he cried. And when he told us this, I know, I know he was serious. He said, Frank, Gio, I cried all night long. I soaked my pillow with my tears. I couldn't believe what I had become. I didn't even know what happened. 
How did I go from preaching and pastoring and ministering and loving people and wanting everybody to come to Jesus to yelling at a guy on TV? What happened to me? And the Lord gave him a gift. And as we talked about it, I shared with him, Dad, the Bible tells us in Revelation that when we all go before the great white throne of judgment and we see our lives and we hear all the things we said and did and all these things happen, that everyone is going to be crying and there's going to be tears. But then the Lord is going to wipe away our tears because he's going to forgive the believers. And I said, you've got a gift. You got your tears wiped away before you died. And I shared this at his memorial service about the gift he got to have his tears wiped away before he died. So when he died, he could hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I shared his story at the, during my eulogy at his memorial service, as I said. And now I've been given a new heart physically, but I'm being given a new heart spiritually. My surgeon told me if I just do two simple things, take a baby aspirin and take my blood pressure beta blocker pill, I'm good for at least 20 years, not a problem. There's nothing wrong with my heart. I don't have bad cholesterol. I don't have clogged arteries. I don't have any of these problems. He said, you're good for 20 years with what I did for you. I've rebuilt your heart. You're good for 20 years. But just take that baby aspirin. I don't even have to take a whole aspirin. I just got to take a baby aspirin. Talk about baby steps, right? And I got to take a blood pressure pill, which is basically what he called a beta blocker. It does something to help the heart do the things it's supposed to do. You're good for 20 years. That's all you have to do. That's it. Now, I've shared with you a bunch of things, but I'm not standing here before you today as a man who's crushed and defeated or downcast or depressed even though I've gone through a lot of self-examination and spent some time crying over the things that I did and didn't do I've made some major mistakes but now I'm standing here as a man with a gift a new lease on life you see I have a gift now to see the deception of the enemy. How he tricked me. How he deceived me. How he fed my ego. How he did the different things he did. And probably had I died on November 5th, 2023. 22, thank you. Had I died, I probably would have heard this from the Lord pretty good with the things you wanted to do but you really didn't do much of my will so I can't say well done good and faithful servant Whew. nobody wants to hear that but that's probably what I would have heard he did pretty good but not as good as you could have if you'd have stopped lying to yourself a few years ago If you'd have made those changes about what you want and what you think and how the church should be and how ministry should be and how people should be, if you'd have made those changes, you probably would have heard, well done, good and faithful servant. But I can't really say that because I'm not a liar. I speak the truth. And I'm telling you the truth in love. And when that hit me, that that's probably what I would have heard, that shook me. Really shook me. So... I know that if I do the things that God wants me to do, and if I begin to change things, if I follow my earthly physician's advice and take my two, my, my two little pills, I'm good for 20 years. But if I follow my heavenly physician's advice, and if I simply seek His kingdom first, earnestly, with all my heart, while He can be found, it's going to make a major difference for me in my life. I've got a couple of more things to share, just a few moments more, but Joe, did you want to share something? I thought so. Oh, yes. We need a mic. Okay. Is it on? Okay, okay good. All right. Can I get that moved back a little bit? Oh, it's, just, it's just a... It's I know, not really I there. I on my face. 
because I'm getting old. I don't want everybody oh, okay. to see the wrinkles. <laughs> they can zoom out. They can zoom out? Oh, yeah, they zoom out. All right. Zoom out, guys. <laughs> All right, guys. Oh, man. Uh, this is really, for me, it's really a truly miracle day. You know, I wasn't even sure seven months ago, you know, that we would be, that he would be here, you know. And I want to thank you all, you know, for your prayers during the difficult time we went through. Um, I always find a lot of treasures in the darkness. Anytime I go through a lot of hard times, I, the Lord always gives me these treasures. And knowing I was going to come here today, you know me, I hate getting up and speaking in front of people. One-on-one, -on -one, I'm great, but I hate being up here. But um, I felt he wanted me to share one of the treasures that he was giving me. Um, I know I shared this with you personally, but I felt he wanted me to do it corporately. But laugh out loud, my husband took my whole message. <laughs> so... I will share it um, basically the way I, he gave it to me. So Psalm 119.29, which he had used, keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. I opened to this one night as I was going through a really rough time. I opened the Bible, and this is the way the Lord speaks to me, and I say, Lord, show me something. I open up, and scripture is there. And... I kept, it, I kept it in my heart. I didn't understand it completely. Uh, and I said, show me myself. The next day, I was out there and I was sending a text to someone. And I was telling them something really good that I was doing. And I felt in my heart, why are you, why are you doing this? What are you really looking for? You know? And immediately... I saw that I wanted to show the person how I sacrifice for others and how good I am. I'm sure none of you do that, right? You just don't want other people to see all well, the good things you do. I could have dismissed it and I went on with the text. But the scripture kept burning in my heart. So I deleted the text and I, I didn't send it because he was starting to show me my motives. And I realized my motive was wrong. What I was saying was okay, but my motive was wrong. And the scripture kept coming back. It's the lies we tell ourselves. We're so good at it that we don't even know we're lying to ourselves. It's the little foxes that are hard to see. So my challenge today for all of you is to ask the Lord to show you yourself. Don't look at others. Before you do that, you have to take the log out of your own eyes. When you find yourself judging someone else, stop, ask the Holy Spirit to show you yourself. Remember, God looks at the heart. He already knows what's in there. So he already knows what's going on. You may not know it because you lie to yourself. We may come across very sweet on the outside or the opposite, very rough. But the Lord knows our hearts. We can't fool them. So let's stop fooling ourselves and let's decide to stop lying to ourselves. Remember, knowing his instructions is a privilege. And that's what was really getting me. I want to know his instruction. We all, you know, we ask the Holy Spirit, what should we do? What should, and we really can't hear completely because there's so much lies in us. It's not for everyone. Even though many people go around speaking for God, a lot of them are totally deceived. And I'm talking about ministers also. And the more they lie themselves to themselves, the more they're so far away from hearing I wrote this down because I know I forget. They're so far away from hearing his instructions. And they're open to hear the father of lies. I call them your stepfather. Because he's the father of lies. And the more that we believe in lies, the more we're pleasing him. Which at times sounds, he sounds like the Holy Spirit at times. The enemy can also read our mail and he gives us counterfeit instructions. 
Don't be impressed with people's gifts and don't confuse them for the Holy Spirit. Look for true humility that comes when you stop lying to yourselves and are privileged to hear his instructions. Then we will truly know when the Holy Spirit is speaking and not the father of lies. We programmed ourselves from when we were little to deceive ourselves. Because of this, it's going to take a lot of self-evaluation, especially in the beginning when you start the journey. Maybe you can find someone to be accountable with, someone you can trust and able to see their fruits, and you can speak truth in love together. The renewing of the mind does not come easy. It takes a lot of work to truly look inside and allow the Holy Spirit to show us our true motives. It could get pretty ugly when we start looking at ourselves. I have been on this journey for a while now, and I must tell you, it's really not easy. And of course, I haven't arrived, but just knowing that this is how I get the privilege of knowing his instructions, it makes it all worth the work that I'm doing. What I'm saying is hard for me to even explain, and I feel it goes so much deeper than the way I'm explaining it, but the only thing I could do is my prayer is that those who have ears will hear what the Spirit is saying. So that's what I felt that the Lord had told me to share with you, which is one of my treasures that he has given me. And I challenge you all to kind of everything you do, ask yourself, what am I doing this for? What's my motive? Am I lying to myself? And believe me, he will show you because that's a prayer. He wants to answer. He's looking for a people that he could use and the people that are not listening to the father of lies, but to the Holy Spirit. It's a very sensitive place to be, but if you want it, he's there for you, but you have to ask for it. But thank, thank you all for you know praying for us and being there and for whatever you've done while we were going through this time. And uh, we really love you. And I hope we could all go on this journey together of not lying to ourselves. Amen. So, Amen. finish. Thank you, Gio. Thank you, honey. As you can see, when she got that happen, she had that scripture, and then she was sending that text out the next day, and she started, she always uh, will share whatever she's writing to somebody with me, and she always wants me to share what I'm writing with, to somebody with her, but I don't do it. But I'm doing it a little bit more. But when she did that, and then she started to go through this whole self-examination, like, why am I writing this down? Why am I telling this person all that I did, blah, 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 this and that? And she realized, I wanted them to think really highly of me. How good I am. And she just deleted it, so I'm not doing it. I'm not giving into it. And I'm like, wow. That's my hero. So we need to get into understanding the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's what counts. Not how people can sing or prophesy and preach messages. That is not the proof of a Christian life. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. Nothing else. So let me finish with this thought. David says in Psalm 57 verse 7, My heart is fixed. O God, my heart is is fixed. Now I love this scripture. I've preached from it before, but I've never gotten it the way I've gotten it now. David says twice, my heart is fixed, because that word fixed in Hebrew has two meanings. So what he's doing is he's giving us the first meaning when he says, my heart is fixed, and then he gives us the second meaning when he says, my heart is fixed, and this is what they are. The first one means, my heart has become stable and established. You see, he was in a time of trouble when things were going bad, and he was concerned and worried about the future. But he said, my heart is fixed. I'm stable now. I'm back together. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm established. I, I won't fall now. I'm not going to falter. And then he says, oh God, my heart is fixed. And the second meaning means, now I'm going to walk on the right path. My heart is fixed. 
Amen. It's stable. It's secure. It's established. But I need my spiritual life to be more stable, secure, and established. So that I can then say my heart is fixed. Oh God, my heart is fixed. I'm in the right path. I'm taking the right direction. I'm following your instructions. If I had died, and when Gio said that before, you know, she didn't know if we'd be here today or if I'd be here today because when I was in that surgery for nine and a half hours, someone said to her, Do you, is he going to be okay? And she honestly had to say, I don't know if he's going to make it. I haven't heard from God. So if I had died, I would, have not have, I would not have heard, well done, good and faithful servant. And I would be crying and crying and crying before the great white throne like so many others. But he fixed my heart. And so, like my father got a gift to do his tears now, I've been given that gift too. I was so touched this morning around 3, 3 o'clock, 3.15, I had a dream. And I woke up out of this dream. And as I was dreaming it, I was getting the understanding of it. It wasn't the dream that mattered so much. It was what I was getting out of it. And what I got out of it was the understanding about my father's situation, what happened to him, and how it applies to me. And I am my father's son. And I thank God for that. And I found the other day, I couldn't believe it, I had his, the only thing I've got of my father's that I treasure is his old handkerchief that he would use when he was preaching. And I lost it for a while. I couldn't find it. But I found it just recently. So I've kept it on my dresser. And I said, Dad, you're coming with me today. And then I said, Mom, you too. And that's why I thank God for them. Because they truly were the two most important people of my life. And they helped me to become who I am. And they're still telling me. Phyllis, you believe what he's saying to you? You really believe him? Yes, Frank, I believe him. He's my son. I love him. And I'm like, keep on believing, Mom. Keep on believing. And I avoid my father's stare because he knew I was lying through my teeth. Who did it? Who took it? Where happened? What happened? But now... I've come to that point where my heart is fixed. I thank God. Amen. I pray today. This is, the message is really not for me. I've gotten it now. It's for you. Don't have to have a heart attack. Don't have to be on a, on a deathbed situation before you start to truly do what Keith said today. Examine yourself. Before you have... You see, we lie to ourselves. There are people sitting here right now who are carrying grudges carrying a grudge against a Christian brother or sister and you're lying to yourself and when you have communion it's not benefiting you the way it's intended to because you're lying to yourself because Jesus said if you have something against your brother or your sister go to them and make it right before you go to the altar and there are husbands and wives who could be sitting here right now who are carrying anger on the inside like bitterness and you're lying to yourself because of your situation and if you don't make it right you're going to extend the pain for years to come so I encourage you start to truly examine yourself and ask God to speak to you and touch you Amen how, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gifts you've given to me. And Lord, I ask you to help each person to simply do what you've told us to do in the Word. The man in hell looked up at Abraham and said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus down here. Send me some water. He said, he can't go there. Too great a distance between us. Go tell him, tell him to tell my brothers not to be like me. And Abraham said, they have the Bible. Yeah, but they don't read it. They don't listen to it. 
And he says, if they don't listen to that, they won't even listen to a man who rose from the dead. And Lord, we don't listen to your words. And we don't listen to Jesus who rose from the dead. We play the games. Lying to ourselves. And so I ask you today, destroy the works of the devil. Open our eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of our hearts. We want to see you. Help us, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray your blessing upon your people. Would you stand with me, please? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to let your blessing be upon all your people. Lord, make your face shine upon them. Let your countenance shine upon them. And Lord, give them peace, I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all for being here today and for listening and those online. Thank you for tuning in and watching today also. And I truly pray that you take my words to heart and allow God to fix your heart. Amen.